All right, great to have everyone in our class today. This class is called Faith Foundations. We're talking about things that are, that are basic to our understandings of the Bible. And uh, last week, we talked at length about what changed after the death and resurrection of Christ. And we talked about the fact that the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached for the first time. The new covenant was offered to people for the first time after the death and resurrection of Christ. And today we're going to get into what exactly is the gospel. You know, we throw that term around all the time. What is it? What's the content of the gospel? And uh, just FYI, if you want to see the content of the gospel, just read the speeches in the book of Acts. Read all the apostolic speeches in the book of Acts, and they'll very much tell you what the content of the gospel is. The word gospel does not refer to the entire Bible. The word gospel refers to the preaching that was done to unbelievers, to people that were outside of Christ, to convict them about Christ and to bring them into a relationship with Christ. That's what the gospel is. And up on the screen there, you see some of the basic elements that were included in the preaching of the gospel in the ancient church. Uh, When I say in the ancient church, I'm not talking about in the church, in a church building, because they didn't have them. But uh, I'm talking about when they conveyed the gospel to people who were outside of Christ, what did they say? What was the content of that message? Uh, One of the factors in that message was how God had shown people that Jesus really was from God. That's the part about the approval of God or the attestation of God for Jesus. And of course, that was by his miracles and signs and wonders which he did in the world. Then a a big portion of the gospel was about the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and what that meant uh, for people. The lordship of Jesus was a core content element of the gospel, meaning that he's been risen, he's been exalted, he's now king and lord over all things, and everybody must submit to him. That was a core element in the gospel, okay? And then when people realized that, they, that Jesus had done the redemptive work and was lord, then they were called to submit to him by repentance and baptism. And then, of course, was the task of living for Jesus every single day. Now, I'd like to look at a couple of samples, one that you're familiar with and maybe one that you're not as familiar with about the gospel itself. And so everybody turn your Bibles to Acts 2, and we're going to look at the first gospel lesson. Last week in our class, we talked about the connection between Luke 24, verse 47, and Acts 2. Because in Luke 24, 47, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told them that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And they were to wait in the city of Jerusalem. So, of course, that doesn't happen until you get to Luke's second volume, the book of Acts. We talked last week about how that in Acts Chapter 1 and verse 4 and 5, the apostles were told to stay there and that not many days from then they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said to his apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. So, In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, Jesus ascends to heaven. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, they all go and wait for him at Jerusalem, see? And that leads us to Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles as promised, and they preached the first gospel sermon as promised. So the actual preaching of the gospel begins in Acts 2, 22. It's preceded by... an Old Testament quotation that prophesied the coming days of salvation. And in Acts 2, verse 21, uh, it said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Basically, you could summarize the Pentecost sermon like this. The Pentecost sermon is proving that Jesus is Lord, upon whom all people must call, in whom all people must depend in order to be saved. So he begins in the very next verse talking about Jesus, who's the subject of the Gospels. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. Notice the wording here. A man attested by God to you. See, how did God testify to Jesus that Jesus really was sent from God? Well, he tells you here. Attested by God to you by what? Miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in your midst, even as you yourselves know. So all of you know that Jesus was a great worker of signs and wonders and miracles, which showed that God was with him. See, that's the attestation by God of Jesus, showing that Jesus really was from God. You know, in many other passages, like in the Gospel of John, when the Christ comes, will he do any more signs than this man is doing? You know, uh, the Gospel of John itself, many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 20, uh, 30 and 31. So God bore witness to Jesus through the signs. And notice he says here at the end of verse 22, you all know this because the people who lived in Judea, they were well familiar with the workings of Jesus, so they, they understood that. Now look at verse 23 on your screen or in your Bible. Him, that's Jesus of Nazareth, him being delivered up by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. See, the death of Jesus was not an accident. It was not a happenstance. It was not something that just happened randomly. It was planned. It was purposed. It was part of God's eternal redemptive plan. It was supposed to happen. Now, last week, again, for those of you that were here, we studied the last part of Luke, and Jesus explained the predetermined plan of God from the Old Testament Scriptures. And in Luke 24, verse 46, in Jesus explaining that, he said, thus it is written in the Old Testament, excuse me, number one, that the Christ must suffer, number two, that he must rise from the dead the third day. And number three, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations starting where? In Jerusalem, okay? So even that little passage in Luke 24 shows you that it was God's preordained purpose and plan that those things should happen. Now the first two of those things happened in the Gospel of Luke. He was crucified in Luke 23. He rose from the dead the third day in Luke 24, but the preaching of repentance and remission of sin starting at Jerusalem doesn't start until Acts chapter 2, where we are right here on the screen. See, so this was done by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. And he's talking to a Jewish audience there. And he says, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put him to death. Okay. So it was the Jews who delivered Jesus to Pilate. It was the Jews that told Pilate, you take him and crucify him. It was the Jews that told Pilate, if you don't crucify him, you're no friend of Caesar's. See? So it was, it was by their design that he was delivered to Pilate and crucified. Okay? But verse 24 says, whom? And that's still referring to Jesus. God raised up having loosed the bonds of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So what do we have here? Preaching of the gospel. You know that God has shown you that Jesus is from God by all the miracle signs and wonders. Because of God's purpose, you also know that he was delivered up to the, these lawless men and he was crucified and God raised him up. Now this is the central point that's going to be proven in the, in the gospel sermon. God raised him up. See, that's the biggie. That's the thing that if that's true, it's all true. If that's not true, none of it's true. See, that's the point of crucial, the, the crucial issue is the resurrection of Christ because Buku people were crucified by the Romans. Many, many thousands of people were crucified. They were just people that got killed, period, end of story. But the message is that this death 
is the, is the plan of God that's necessary for salvation and that God raised this man from the dead to prove this, okay? So the, the assertion of the resurrection is in verse 24. Then he begins to prove the resurrection of the dead. And he gives you this long quotation from the 16th Psalm. And in verse 27, he gets to the nut of it where David says in Psalm 16, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So many, many years ago, a thousand years before Christ, David wrote these words. See? Who was David talking about? Now, Hades, back in the Hebrew Old Testament, Sheol is the word. It means the grave. Okay? You will not leave my soul in Sheol, in the grave. You're not going to leave me in the grave. You're not going to allow your Holy One to see corruption. He's not going to rot in the grave like other people do. See? Who was David talking about when, by the Holy Spirit, he penned these words? See, he's Peter. Yeah, Jesus. So he was working on his first proof of the resurrection. See, the Scriptures foretold it, like Jesus said in Luke 24. Now, if you drop down to verse 29... Peter explains this quotation. He says, men and brethren, I may speak freely of you, of the patriarch David, that David died and was buried, and his tomb is still with us to this day. Why are you saying that, Peter? To show that David was not talking about David. (laughs) See? Because David died, David was buried, and he rotted in the ground, and he, he was left in the grave, and he did see corruption. So it's not talking about David, okay, when you come down to verse 30, therefore David being a prophet, what's a prophet? Well, a prophet is one who speaks by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, see? David being a prophet uh, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, uh, he would set one upon his throne, see, this is God's promise to David, He, foreseeing this, that is in verse 31, David, foreseeing this, spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. Now, I want you to compare this verse on the screen with verse 27, if you have your Bible open. Notice, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. See, if you compare that back here with verse 27... You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. See, verse 31, he says that's talking about Christ. So point number one of why we can believe in the resurrection of Jesus, it was prophesied ahead of time by who? David in Psalm 16. All right, point number two comes in verse 32. This Jesus did God raise up, whereof we are all witnesses. Now, if you've read Luke and Acts, you know that in Luke 24, you know, Jesus appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. Then later he appeared to the the whole group and he ate with them, you know, after the resurrection. If you look at Luke 1, what, verse 3 or something... He appeared to them by the space of 40 days, speaking to them the things concerning the kingdom of God. So numerous appearances to the apostles, okay? Numerous appearances to the apostles. And then if you go to Acts 1 and drop down to about verse, I don't know, 29 or so, he says, of the, this is when Judas hung himself and they're picking another apostles, apostle. Of the men that have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up to heaven, must one of these be chosen to be a witness along with us of his resurrection. Okay? So the apostles were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. Which is what Peter says in verse 32. Old Testament foretold it. And you guys read the Old Testament. Number two, we've all seen him numerous times over 40 days. We know he's alive. We've seen him. Number three is in verse 33. 
Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God. Well, church, after his resurrection, who was exalted to the right hand of God? Jesus, okay? And having received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he, that's talking about Jesus, has poured out this which you now see and hear. But see, if you go back to the beginning of Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the apostles, there was a, a, a mighty rushing wind, and there was a flame of fire over the apostles' heads, and these people heard the apostles speaking in their languages, all the languages of these country, uh, countries, so the miracle could be seen because of the tongues of fire over the apostles' heads, it could be heard not only by the mighty wind, but by the speaking in the other languages of the apostles. So he, the risen Christ, has poured forth this which all of you now see and hear. What does this prove? This proves that he must be what? Alive, if he poured out the miracle that day. So point one of Peter's sermon. The Old Testament foretold it. Point two of Peter's sermon. We've all seen it. Point three, he's the one that poured out the miracle this day. Okay, what's he trying to prove in this whole thing? The resurrection of Jesus, all right? Remember, right before this proving of the resurrection, he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, now he says, verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know this one thing for sure. I've proved this to you in this lesson, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord, and Christ, that means king, master, ruler, okay? That's the nut. That's the main point of the Pentecost sermon, that God really has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. And he'd already said, the Old Testament said, that when all this happens, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, who is Lord? Jesus is Lord, okay? So, when they heard this, when they heard what? That God has for sure made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. When they heard this, and knowing that they must call on the name of the Lord, they said, okay, then what shall we do? And that's when he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Do you remember last week when we took Luke 24, 47 and Acts 2, 38 and showed the, both of them talk about repentance and both of them talk about remission of sins and both of them talk about in the name of Jesus and it was first preached in Jerusalem? Well, this is where that was, all right? So they were told to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What do we have here? The gospel is designed to convict people about the preordained death and resurrection of Jesus, that those things were real, that those things really happened, and that God has really placed Jesus in the position of being ruler, Lord, master over all things, okay? And then when that conviction comes, okay, now that we're convicted of that, we trust that that's the truth, now what are we supposed to do? Well, you've got to repent. You've got to turn away from your rejection of Jesus and your selfish way of living, You've got to turn to Jesus and submit to him. What does submit mean? That means you're going to try to do what he says. Okay? You're going to repent and you're going to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, see, there had been other baptisms in the past. But never, ever before this time, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins based on the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ this is the first time that was ever preached, see? And Luke 24, 47, at the end of Luke, says repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name starting at Jerusalem. Right here it is, okay? And so to everyone who does that, he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, what promise? Well, the only promise here is repent. I mean, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the promise of receiving the Holy Spirit is to you and your children and to all who are far off. See, this is, this is the offer of the new covenant. This never was offered before now. But now this promise is to you and your children and all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
How are we called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Well, last week we learned from Scripture we're called by the gospel, aren't we? And today we're talking about what is the gospel, what is the content of the gospel, and how people are called to obey the gospel in their lives. And of course, if you read the rest of the book of Acts, you can see this, thing, this same thing repeated over and over again. Now, just for grins, let's look at another scripture real quickly here in Acts. I want to invite you to turn to Acts 10. This is where Peter was preaching the gospel to a seeker, a pagan soldier who was interested in God. His name was Cornelius. He was the centurion of the Italian cohort, commander of a hundred men. Anyway, uh, Peter was nervous about going to Cornelius because he was a Gentile, but in Acts 10, verse 34, Peter finally started to preach, and he said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. The message which he sent to the children of Israel, preaching good news, that's another word for gospel, of peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. See that? Isn't that what he preached on Pentecost? That saying you yourselves know, which was published throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, even Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now take verse 38 there, which is about how God attested by the miracles that Jesus really was from God. Isn't that the first thing he dealt with at Pentecost? Where he said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God to you by miracles and signs and wonders which God did by him in your midst as you yourselves know. He's doing exactly the same thing here. See, And we are witnesses of all the things which he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom also they slew hanging him on a tree. That's the same thing he said in Acts 2, 23, right? Him God raised up the third day. That's Acts 2, 24. Same thing, the resurrection. And gave him to be made manifest. That means caused him to appear to people. Not to all the people but to witnesses that were chosen before by God, even to us. Now, doesn't that sound like this Jesus did God raise up, whereof we are all witnesses? See what I'm saying? See, the words, we're we're modern-day readers, and the words sound different, but it's exactly the same message. It's exactly the same message. You know, we even ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. You can read about that in Luke 24. And he, that's Jesus, charged us, that's the apostles, to preach to the people, which they started doing at Pentecost, and they'd been doing ever since, and to testify that this is he, this Jesus, whom God has ordained to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes on him shall receive the remission of sins. Okay? And, of course, then you know the rest of the story, how that God poured a miracle out on the Gentiles to show the Jews that it was okay to baptize them into Christ, and Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, down in verse 47 and 48. Okay, so that is an example of the preaching and teaching of the gospel. People have said, how much does a person have to know before they become a Christian? Well, you don't have to know everything. But you do need to know that God sent Jesus Christ into the world. That, you know, God became flesh in Jesus. That he was proved to be from God by his miracles and signs and wonders. That he died for our sins. That he rose from the dead and God has made him Lord of all. And in order to submit to that lordship, we must repent. Trusting in Jesus and be baptized into him for the forgiveness of our sins. Those things a person must know, okay, in order to become a Christian, all right? Now, if you read all the speeches in Acts, they're different, but they're the same. 
read Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin where he develops the whole scheme of God in the Old Testament and talks about the righteous one, Jesus, and how he's come, you know, and how they're rejecting him. Read what Philip told the eunuch in Acts chapter 8 when he told him about the death of Jesus from Isaiah 53. You know, read all kinds of different things that uh, in the book of Acts. Read uh, uh, the Cornelius uh, speech that we've just read. Uh, you can read uh, the, the message of the jailer, the story of the jailer. You can read all these different accounts, and they all say basically uh, the same thing. Acts 13 is Paul's speech to the synagogue in, in Antioch of Pisidia, and you can hear the gospel preached there. See? Acts 17 to the Athenians, you know, the death and resurrection of Jesus. All right, so the speeches in Acts give us a good idea of the content of the gospel, which is basically, if I can go back real quickly, this. How God approved Jesus and attested to him by the miracles and signs, how he died according to God's purpose and rose again, how he's Lord, Lord over all things, repentance called for by the people, baptism, and then we have to live for the one we've submitted to. That's the gospel. All right, now... So now let's talk about the church of Jesus Christ. Before we go on, question about any of that stuff from Acts. About the gospel. And isn't that, feel free to raise your hand if you want to, isn't that the content of the gospels, basically? If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what the apostles preached on, isn't that basically what we find in our written gospels? Uh-huh, it is. Okay? All right. So now, see, we talked last week about what changed at the resurrection of Jesus. Well, the gospel started be, uh, to be preached, and people who obeyed the gospel now became Christians. The first Christians. There were no Christians before the death and resurrection of Jesus. These are the first Christians. All right, and these Christians were part of a group. That group is the church. So those who accepted the offer of the new covenant through repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus were added by Christ to his church. His church is the group of redeemed people. All right, so let's look at our book of Acts. Everybody open up your Bibles to Acts 2. And let's follow some progress report things by Luke through the book of Acts for just a little bit. Um, it's helpful when I've studied the gospel with people to just show them these passages because they see this, if they can see it with their own eyes and put their own finger on it. So in Acts 2, let's, let's just start with verse 38. You know, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for that promise is to you and your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, Peter encouraged and testified to them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those that gladly received his message. What do we call that message that Peter had just preached? The gospel. They gladly accepted that message. See, the message, a person has to be convicted and converted to the message. They gladly received his message. They were baptized, like he said in verse 38, right? And they were added to their number about 3,000 souls that day. Now, if you look at your Bibles, some of them will, will uh, word it slightly differently, but it uses the word prostithemy, which means added, added to them about 3,000 souls. So those 3,000 souls who accepted the message and were baptized were added to them. I guess added to the apostles who were there before them. All right? Now, if you drop down to verse 47, those of you will have this worded a little differently. If you're reading the King James tradition, either Old King James or New King James, It'll say added to the church. If you're reading another version uh, based on the critical text, it'll say added to their number. 
But verse 47, praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So those who accepted the message and were baptized, or these people here, those who were being saved, they were added to their number. They were added to the church. By the way, church in the New Testament means a group or a gathering of people. What group? Well, the group that heard the message of Jesus and accepted it and were baptized. See? So they were added to that number. All right? Let's, let's look a little further in the book of Acts. Uh, look over at Acts 4, verse 4. I want you to compare Acts 4, 4. Actually, it'd be better to, uh, com- uh, to compare it with Acts 2, 41. Because Acts 2, 41 says they were added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Remember that? And here in Acts 4, 4, at the bottom of the screen there, many of those who heard the message believed. Now compare that to Acts 2.41. Those who gladly accepted his message. See, they heard the message and believed. They didn't reject the message. They accepted the message. They were baptized. So many have heard the word and believed, and the number of the men came to be 5,000. Why are you saying that? Because I told you in chapter 2, verse 41, that there were 3,000 that were added. And then in verse 47, that they were added every day, those that were being saved... And now in this verse, the number came to be 5,000. See, these are Luke's own comments at the progress and growth of that group of people that are called the church. Look at Acts 5.14. I've crammed some verses onto this screen, uh, comparing them with Acts 2.47, but the second one down is Acts 5, verse 14. And this, this is after the arrest of Peter and John and after Peter and John had been told not to preach anymore and they were still preaching. It says, believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Have you seen that terminology earlier in Acts? Added to the Lord? 241, 247, compare 44, now 514. The believers were the more added to the Lord. All right? Then the one at the bottom of the screen is Acts 6, verse 7. Turn to Acts 6, verse 7. It starts out, and the word of God spread. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't every single case of this where the message was preached about Jesus, his death, and his resurrection, and then people responded to that message and were added to the Lord, right? Right? So here the word of God spread. See, the message has to be preached first. The gospel has to be preached. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. See, that's, that's another statement of when the word is preached and people respond favorably, there's more and more disciples. Okay? And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. What does that mean? They were obedient to the faith. Have an idea? That means they repented and were baptized, like it said earlier. Okay, then look at um, chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 is after the conversion of Cornelius. Chapter 11, if you'll start with verse 19, chapter 11, verse 19. It says, those that were scattered abroad uh, because of the persecution, persecution around the death of Stephen, see, Well, that takes you back to Acts 8, 4, where Saul was destroying the church and all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, the people, the apostles, all the people except the apostles were scattered from Jerusalem to other regions. So now they're up in Antioch of Syria, and they're preaching the gospel in Antioch of Syria. And uh, Barnabas is there. And in Acts 11, 21, it says, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of people. Uh, People believed and turned to the Lord. Verse 24, talking about Barnabas, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and truth, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Does that sound familiar? A great many people were added to the Lord. Trace the terminology back all the way back to Acts 2, and you'll see that the same thing is happening here as was in Acts 2. How do you get added to the Lord? Well, you've got to hear the gospel message and be convicted by it. 
And you've got to decide you're going to trust in Jesus. And you've got to understand that God has raised him from the dead and made him Lord. And you need to submit to him. And you repent and you're baptized and you're added by God to his group, his church. That's what happened. Okay? Now, the terminology church is used periodically in Acts to describe this group. And you can say, well, what group? And if you're used to reading the Bible, just picking out verses, this isn't going to help you much. But if you'll start at the beginning of the book of Acts and read all of it up through all these passages, you'll figure out that there's a group that's being talked about from the very beginning, and the group started on the day of Pentecost. What's another word for group? Church. All right? And, and he keeps telling you throughout here that more people were added to that group along. Yes? Okay. So now in Acts chapter 5, when it tells you uh, in this same section about more people being added to the Lord, great fear came upon all the church. Well, what's the church? Well, it's this group that people have been being added to. Why were they afraid? Because Peter and John got arrested and the Jews were telling them not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus and persecute him. So great fear came upon the whole church. Buildings don't fear. What fears? People. People who are following Jesus. They were afraid, see? Then in Acts 8, 1, after Stephen gets killed and Saul of Tarsus is holding his clothes, it says, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church which is at Jerusalem. Well, isn't that where the gospel was first preached? Didn't it even say in Luke 24, 47, that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem? So the church at Jerusalem is that group that was started in Acts chapter 2. And Saul, it says, made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women. So the church is made up of men and women. What kind of men and women? They've heard the message of Christ. They've been convicted by it. They've repented of their sins, have been baptized, and the Lord has added them to the church. Okay? So the persecution against the church. And most of the church was scattered, Acts 8 verse 4, right after this out of Jerusalem, and only the apostles were left there. When you go over to Acts 9, this is after the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, it says, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Well, why did they have peace? Because their great persecutor Saul was now a Christian. So they had peace. And then walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it was multiplied. See, that's another progress report that Luke gives, that the church was growing and growing and growing. Now, what church was it? Well, there wasn't but one at that time. This was the one established by the apostles on the day of Pentecost. And it was all about following Jesus Christ. See? As Lord, there was just one church. And this church was being multiplied. Now, notice this part in verse 31. Throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. That sounds a lot like Acts 1.8. You guys are going to be my witnesses. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the other uttermost parts of the earth, which we see happening. It's starting to spread out here all over the place. Okay? So then... Down in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, and this is going to be our end-up verse for today. We haven't given you too much time for questions, so I apologize for that. But this is basic stuff that will help you maybe in teaching somebody. This is talking about Barnabas, who preached at Antioch of Syria, and then he went and found Saul and brought Saul over there to help him. When he, Barnabas, had found him, Saul, he brought him, Saul, back to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they gathered together with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. This is a great verse, church, for this reason. 
this verse, if you've read the whole book of Acts, shows you that whenever there's a church, that church is made up of disciples. And if you go back through the book of Acts, it says, you know, the number of disciples multiplied. More disciples were added. So when a person hears the gospel, is convicted, repents, and is baptized, they become a disciple of Jesus. You know, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them. So they were disciples. But they were called Christians. So a Christian, a follower of Christ, one who submits to Jesus as Lord and trusts in Jesus for their salvation, is also called a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is also a member of the church of Jesus Christ. So what am I? I'm a Christian. What am I? A disciple of Christ. What am I? A member of Christ's church. See? That's just basic stuff from the book of Acts. Yes, sir. Yes. His, his comment is, for those of you out there, that the, originally the term Christian might not have been complementary to some people, depending on who's used it. Uh, you know, the, the followers of Herod, they called Herodians. Uh, the, the followers of Christ, they call them Christianos, Christians. But to the, to the Christians themselves, it was a compliment. And later, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him glorify God in that name. And then later on in, in Acts 26, 28, when Paul was preaching the gospel to old King Agrippa and trying to persuade him, King Agrippa says, Paul, do you think that with such little persuasion you would make me into a what? A Christian? And Paul said, yes, I do. And not only you, but everybody's listening to me this day. I hope they would become the same thing that I am. You guys have a great rest of the morning, and we'll talk next week.